We know there are many choices in internet radio, and the staff and host of LA Talk Live would like to thank you for choosing the internet's hottest destination for the most eclectic sound and invigorating talk. This is LA Talk Live. We are more than just talk. Reaching out to the four corners of the globe and broadcasting to you live from the studios of L.A. Talk Live in sunny, beautiful Los Angeles, California. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to tonight's live episode of the one and only It's the Marijuologist, the world's only show that gets to the very root of the medical cannabis issue throughout California and the globe. Tonight, we have some very special guests joining us either live in the studio, but most importantly, we've got a member of LEAP joining us. That's right, LEAP rejoins us again tonight on our live episode. Law Enforcement Action Partnership is at the very tip of the spear of the drug war. We bring them on every other week to speak common sense to the waste, to all the money we are spending in our futile effort to try to end the war against drugs. Listen, it's not going to work. There is another way, and we intend to explore that here tonight on the world's only show that really gets to the root of it. This is the Marijuologist. I'm your humble host, Richard Carr. We've got some calling guests going to be joining us live on our Skype line. We're going to be opening up our phone line a little later on in the show for you to join us as well. I see the calls are coming in already. Hey, everybody, calm down. We're not quite ready yet, but because before we get to the start of the show, as always, we have a very important message from our good friends at LEAP.CC, Law Enforcement Action Partnership, and one of the guys that I'd really like to get locked into the show one day. His name is Neil Franklin, and he is, in fact, the CEO, uh, the executive producer, uh, the man on top over at Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. The Law Enforcement Action Partnership is there now known. So be sure to stay tuned. We're going to be playing some of that clip from him tonight. And we're going to be talking with an official speaker from the organization, LEAP.cc. Go to their website. I'm Richard Carr. This is The Marijuologist. We'll be right back. Enjoy this important message from our good friends at LEAP. So I'm sitting here today with Major Neil Franklin from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and he's joining us to add his insights from many years of both law enforcement experience and working in terms of harm reduction and figuring out drug policy. And we really thank you for coming out and joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, so tell me about your work on the issues of addiction treatment and drug policy. How did you first get involved? Oh, wow. Um, Interesting enough, my first glimpse into this problem of drug prohibition was through uh, Baltimore's Mayor Kurt Schmidt. <laughs> Back in the late 80s, going into the 90s, mm -hmm. um, I started my law enforcement career in the late 1970s, and shortly thereafter, I worked undercover in, in, in the 1980s uh, as a NARC in the Washington, D.C. area. Did mm -hmm. some cases, some casework up in the Baltimore area as well. That's where I grew up. And... Um, uh, through uh, some of the work from Mayor Schmilk back then, mm -hmm. um, I got to see and hear how he was beginning to look at this whole issue of the drug war. Right? Mm -hmm. He was first our prosecutor, and uh, I was working undercover the same time that Marcellus Ward was killed, making undercover drug buy in Baltimore City. He was a detective for the Baltimore Police Department. And Mayor Schmilk speaks to this all the time as he was a prosecutor. And I remember that. And then a few years after that, Mayor Schmook becomes a mayor. Well, becomes a mayor from the prosecutor. He starts a needle exchange program. And I happened to be a lieutenant with the Maryland State Police at that time. And I was assigned to the board for his needle exchange program. I was a uniform law enforcement member. Mm -hmm. That was written into the law. So I had to be on that, on that board. Not me particularly, but a uniform mm -hmm. member from law enforcement. 
And that got me to then see things from a health perspective mm -hmm. and what can happen if we start to change our policies. But it wasn't enough to move me in a different direction because soon after that, I became the commander of seven drug task forces in the western part of the state for the Maryland State Police. Mm -hmm. And then nine on the eastern part of the state. And it wasn't until I retired from the Maryland State Police in 2000 when a good friend of mine, Ed Totley, who was working undercover for the Maryland State Police, was killed working a drug deal very similar to that of Marcellus Ward. Mm -hmm. And that caused me to stop and pause for a moment and to reflect back on all the violence that I had witnessed mm -hmm. during my Maryland State Police career. And at that point, I began to realize that I think we're definitely headed in the wrong direction with this war on drugs because the violence continues to increase. More drugs are coming into our communities. Addiction rates are soaring. More potent drugs available. Mm -hmm. Nothing was improving. Mm -hmm. Flaw policy. And um, it was in uh, 2003, right after the Dawson family murder here in Baltimore, a drug dealer set their home on fire in, in East Baltimore. It was right after that that I went online and um, happened to stumble across law enforcement against prohibition, mm -hmm. you know, as we all are looking for support, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I was doing, and I found this group of crime fighters who had already traveled the road that I was now traveling, and uh, I signed on mm -hmm. and uh, became a speaker, started speaking in 2008, became the director of the organization in 2010. I actually stepped away from law enforcement to manage this organization, which is an international organization of crime fighters who have been on the front lines of the war on drugs, and now we're trying to end the war on drugs, which is war on people. Mm -hmm. And you know, during your presentation to the Harm Reduction Conference earlier, you really you emphasize this point of changing the mindset in law enforcement from being warriors to being guardians. Right. What do you see your role as the executive director of LEAP? How do you connect that role back to making that culture shift? Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of roles. Number one, we are a speaker's bureau. Mm -hmm. So basically we have 170 of our thousands of members, 170 have dedicated their time and energy to go out and speak and to educate on so many different levels. Number one, the grassroots level. So we go to community organizations, Rotarian organizations, uh, uh, community-based organizations. We speak at local colleges and universities from Harvard to uh, Baltimore Community College, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, we speak in Annapolis in front of our legislative bodies. We speak on Capitol Hill about the harms of our current war on drugs mm -hmm. and how they affect the lives of people and how we have given law enforcement this duty which shouldn't be theirs. Mm -hmm. It belongs to healthcare practitioners. Mm -hmm. We are attempting to solve a healthcare condition, a health related condition with criminal justice solutions, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We have been here once before with alcohol prohibition in the 1920s. It didn't work then. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we think it would work now. And um, so, managing the organization to keep the Speakers Bureau going, but at the same time, we are trying to educate our brothers and sisters in blue regarding these failed policies, regarding the fact that we are charged with enforcing policies that we should not be, we should be protecting people from people hurting people. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're involved in legislating morality. Mm -hmm. Murder, rape, robbery, crimes against our children, that's where we should be. And we're making a lot of headway, and I think law enforcement leaders around uh, our country now are starting to, to see that and come together to reduce crime and incarceration at the same time and they're starting to take a really good look at these drug laws. Mm -hmm. So that's that's our second thing. We got to bring our brothers and sisters along too and get them thinking differently about this scenario. Mm -hmm. And as you're thinking about that culture change and how really it's the statutes that yeah. You know, first there were the there was the reaction, then there were the statutes, and then there's the enforcement. Right. From your perspective, what needs to be done to address the problems of drug addiction and drug related violence in the state, but also nationally? Like what what needs to take place in order to address these problems? Okay. So first of all, we got to this place not because of scientific data. Mm -hmm. All right. 
It's not a scientific approach. It's about hysteria. It's about social control. It's about some other things, but it's not about a scientific approach. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to look at the data. And if the data does not support the methods that we are currently engaged in, I think it's self-explanatory. Let's change the game. Let's mm -hmm. do something different. But let's look at the data and respond to the data. Um, our incarceration rate, we're 5% of the world's population. We have 25% of the world's prisoners because of the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. Most of the people that we are arresting in the war on drugs are nonviolent drug offenders, people who are suffering from addiction, people who are, uh, you know, possessing drugs. Uh, there's, there's no funding, not enough funding for on-demand treatment, but it's not just about on-demand treatment for addiction to heroin or cocaine or whatever else. It's about wraparound services for that person. Mm -hmm. It's about other health issues they may be dealing with. Many of the people who are suffering from addiction are also suffering from mental health problems as well. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, again, as we continue to collect the data and analyze the data, it's going to be clear that we need to move this from criminal justice to health care. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we see it, it's happening, it's occurring, we just have to keep the momentum going. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. It's, yeah. it's, it's not rockets, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, and, and just another point that, that I want to make, again, when we, as we did, we moved into this place of prohibition expecting results like reduced addiction rates, reduced violence, reduced overdose deaths, uh, reduced usage rates among our young people, and these continue to go in the opposite direction. We need to realize that as August Vollmer said, who was one of the early leaders of the International Association of Chiefs of Police back in the 1920s, as he said, when you drive this business into repression, when you prohibit it and drive it underground, drugs become more plentiful, mm -hmm. okay, because they're more profitable. You're going to have more people selling them. They not only become more profitable, they become more dangerous because of quality control standards, the lack thereof. And those who are addicted then resort to crimes to fund their addictions. Mm -hmm. We've created a very, very bad scenario here. And at the end of the day, you have to ask the question. Drugs are here. They will always be here. Who do you want to manage them? Do we want organized crime, crews on our corners, cartels, or should we, the community, manage drugs within our neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. I think we'll do a much better job absent the murders and the kidnappings and the corruption and everything else that goes along with the illicit drug trade. Absolutely. Um, although the, you know, th these aren't views without their controversy. And Absolutely. It's a deeply political and deeply controversial subject to even bring up harm reduction yeah. in terms of changing laws and changing statutes. Um, what would you say would be the first meaningful step that Maryland could take, since we have um, delegates Morheim and Lamb here with us today at the conference, mm -hmm. what do you think would be the first meaningful step we could take in the state to really begin addressing these issues? I'm going to mention three things, and probably in the order in which I think they should go. The first one is what is referred to as law enforcement assisted diversion, mm -hmm. okay, lead program which is in Seattle and Santa Fe right now. It's when a police officer comes in contact with someone who is either possessing drugs or a low-level distribution to support their habits. Instead of arresting them, it's documented. Okay, the interaction's documented. That documentation is held by the prosecutor's office, but that person is then immediately paired with a healthcare practitioner, mm -hmm. okay, for wraparound services, obviously treatment, and other things that that person may need. And as long as they are in the program, they don't even receive an arrest record, which mm -hmm. is crucial. That's the first thing, and there's much more to that, but that's a quick uh, scenario. Um, the second thing, we need to move to a place of safe consumption rooms. We've done this in Vancouver, in Canada, we're doing it in Switzerland, and we're removing those who are addicted from the street corners, from the shadows, from the alleys, into a place where they can administer and receive their drug under medical supervision. Mm -hmm. This does a number of things. Number one, uh, it saves lives. Mm 
-hmm. In these safe consumption facilities, there's not been one overdose death that I'm familiar with. It mm -hmm. just doesn't happen because if they have a reaction, their medical practitioner is there to deal with that. It has greatly reduced the transmission of HIV through intravenous drug use because they get clean syringes. Mm -hmm. Knowing that they're going to be able to receive what they need on a daily basis, they're not out committing crimes to fund their addiction at the street level, in, again, in the shadows and in the alleys. And all of their other needs are attended to, health-related, job training, job placement, and that's where it needs to be. And then the third is what they've done in Portugal. Let's decriminalize drugs for possession. Portugal's done it for a 10-day personal supply, and they've had great results. Now, I know people are going to say, but we're not Portugal. The principle is the same no matter mm -hmm. where you are. They've had a 71% reduction in overall uh, new cases of HIV for intravenous drug users, a 52% reduction in overdose deaths in Portugal. That's a, that would be a huge number in mm -hmm. this country. For middle and high school kids, between a 22 to 25% reduction in overall drug use, mm -hmm. that's success. And that's where we need it. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. You've been listening to the wise words of Captain Neil Franklin, um, who is, in fact, the... Let's call him the leader of Law Enforcement Action Partnership as they have evolved from law enforcement against prohibition to the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. This is an organization, in case you're just tuning in for the first time, who serve at the very tip of the spear of the drug war. These gentlemen, these women, are incredible in their effort to bring about a common sense component to the discussion of the drug war. We are going to be talking with one of these members tonight at in about, uh, let's say, about five or six minutes. His name uh, is David, and I want to say Lenoy, a distinguished three-career veteran from Massachusetts, where he served as a corrections officer, deputy sheriff, internal legal counsel, chief of staff, superintendent, and special sheriff under six elected sheriffs in the county of Greenfield, Massachusetts. We want you to stay tuned. Right now, we're going to take a little bit of what we like to call a cannabis-infused musical moment. We'll be right back. Equal the Wolf's in the House. I'm your humble host, Richard Carr. The Marijuologist is live right now. Don't go away. <laughs> Happen. 
tripping or something like that. The only thing I'm packing is food in a sack. Cause it's mandatory that I gotta be stoned. Like Ice Cube said, once again it's on. It's a fucked up feeling when you're California fiending. If you smoke blood, you know exactly what I'm meaning. Open up your drawer when you trip cause it's empty. But the night before you could have swore you had plenty. With no connects and don't know what to do. So you try to drink a 40 as a substitute. But it doesn't feel the same as that Mary Jane. Creeping up real slow, marinating my brain. And I've been at the bottom feeling just like a peasant. Saving all my roaches and scraping up my resin. I smoke so much weed that I sweat THC. A day without herb, I can never let it be. Instead of packing like a pack rat, I was packing like a fat cat instead. Can't believe I did it once again. A fucked up habit that I got. I always do it to myself. I'm always smoking on my pot. I got no options. I could call a weedman from the streets. But it's a Monday and it's 6 a.m. before his peak. That's fucking weak. I need some weed. A long morning. THC free. I can't believe I got no marijuana for my brain I always do this cause I need a blunt's my fucking name I need to go at 10 a.m. I pull up to the front, guess what? They're open Oh, why? Weed yeah, we are back. back And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen To tonight's live episode of The Marijuanas The world's only show That explores the impact of cannabis On the entire globe And especially right here in California it all got started. I'm joined tonight by my humble host, E. Quarter Wolf, who will be joining me shortly on the mic. But I wanted to take some time out to acknowledge one of our guests who is going to be calling us momentarily. Uh, we have David, who is going to be joining us all the way from Greenfield, Massachusetts. He is a retired special sheriff from Greenfield who has um, served at the tip of the spear of the drug war. Uh, I believe three decades is what I'm reading here. And in fact, is a member of law enforcement action partnership formerly known as law enforcement against prohibition we're going to be talking to david a little bit later on tonight there are some things that are going on right now though in america with the appointment of um, david sessions that is starting to concern me as a patient it starts concerning me because david sessions is about to do what donald trump did earlier today and that is roll back all of the hard work that has been put in here in this country to help make safe and legal access real for us as cannabis patients and then of course maybe roll back what previous administrations have done when it comes to the battle of the drug war as we know it. Let us all contemplate and think back if we couldn't in fact tally how much money has been lost in the drug war, how much money we as taxpayers have wasted fighting an unwinnable war, and that is the drug war. We have been at this f since the days of R Reagan, um, Bush 1, Bush 2. Barack Obama, our esteemed president, did in fact take some measures to help relieve some of the stress on law enforcement, for one. I think that's important because those are the hardworking individuals out there on the tip of the spear and help relieve some of the stress on cannabis patients, let's just say, because those are the folks who are working hard to, you know, advocate on behalf of safe and legal access. And yet this, this whole other issue of the drug war, uh, without further ado, I'd like to take some time out and get my esteemed colleague connected to the show real quick. That is Ecor the Wolf. Um, he joins us each and every time we do this, which is every other Friday these days. And uh, he brings a unique perspective from the dispensary level. And that perspective relates to how cannabis is getting distributed uh, to patients uh, at the community level. Eco the Wolf, yes. welcome back to the show. What up, Hold, though? Wait for it, wait for it. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, what up, those good people out there? We won't take a lot of time um, on this topic because we do in- indeed have our lead guest on the phone. Oh, yeah. Uh, David is, is joining us live. Hello. David, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you fine. Hello, Very good. David. Let's just take a moment out. I'm going to talk to our uh, esteemed colleague here, Equal to Wolf, again. You're on camera, you know, my brother. All that fiddling you're doing over yeah, there is uh, it, very it's visible. Reality, reality radio. Let them shake it all yeah, out. Right, let whatever, them all see it. Yeah. That's what they don't see on the radio all them years. You know, now they get a chance to see it. See me moving. See me digging my nose. Nah. <laughs> all right. Anyway, tell us what's going on on the streets out there, man. You know, um, cannabis in California is all the rage. Um, uh, everybody thinks it's legal. I was, uh, was David, we're going to have you chime in on it momentarily. I was, but I was definitely going to get to that. Everybody thinks it's legal, but it's not. Can you yes. speak to that and tell us what's happening at the street level? Yeah, I was just getting ready to speak on that as well because there are a lot of dispensaries or collectives uh, that are still getting shut down. I made a call yesterday as a vendor, you know, to do some distribution and uh, or just to do some vending, I should say. And uh, I made a call. And the gentleman, and I, and I was letting him know what the, you know, the orders that I had, everything that I had in you know, product and stock. And he just, like, listened to everything I said. Then the first thing he said was, hey, man, we got shut down. I was like, what? Wow. You know, it's a black-owned company. He's like, yeah, we, and I'm not saying anything racial, but he's like, uh, but it's in the community. It's in the urban neighborhood. So That's where it's going down. He, yeah. said, he said, uh, oh, man. And this also happened in Detroit, Michigan, too, so I've been getting word out there. But he said, we got shut down, and we, so I sold it to another uh, owner. But you can go by there. They might need new product because it's a new company, and they're looking for blah, 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 you know. So it just was shocking to hear how they had got shut down, and they were doing and so well. And one's got to wonder. They were doing well at one yeah, point in time. And one's got to wonder, if you got shut down, how were you able to transfer that business to someone else? I, exactly. I, I don't get that part. Right. But that is the conundrum of what uh, Los Angeles is really all about. Mm-hmm. Uh, but right now, and without further ado, let's welcome to our microphones here uh, our good friend from Law Enforcement Action Partnership, Special Sheriff David Lenoy or Lenoir? <laughs> How should I pronounce you it, my it right. friend? Well, either way is right. Okay, it's That's French. Fine. It's a so French. David Lenoy, welcome to the show. We'll Thank go you. with that. I see. That's a French. That's a French last name, huh, Mr. Lenoir? That's right. My last name is French as well. R O Q U E, pronounced yep. Roque. Okay. All right. So, David, let's get right to it, man. You know, you uh, join us today all the way from. Uh, Greenfield, Massachusetts, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? There you go. There he is. That's right. Green- Greenfield, Mass, in the, in the northeast. Mm-hmm. Wow. R- raining and, and cool tonight. Nice night up here in Massachusetts. Well, it's blazing hot out here in L.A. right now. I hate to say it, but it's blazing hot. Yeah, yeah. We, we like the seasons. So, David, you're a special sheriff. I wanted to start with talking about your background uh, as a okay. law enforcement officer. 30 years on the job. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners out there so I don't massacre it. Tell them a, a little bit about your background in law enforcement, please. Sure. So I got out of college and needed a job, and I took a job as a seasonal employee as a jail deputy in 1984. Finished law school while doing my jail work. Passed the bar exam. Got offered a job in the sheriff's office. Worked my way up the ranks to the position of second in command, which uh, is superintendent and special sheriff here in Massachusetts, worked in three counties, managing correctional facilities at the county level, uh, urban counties, metro county, and then a rural county where I retired from and uh, saw the good, the bad, the ugly in between uh, of the uh, of incarceration, what it looks like, what it feels like, and the drug-related crime sentences that we all know and don't love uh, here in the United States. So I uh, finished my 32 years. A couple of years ago, um, I'm speaking for LEAP. Uh, I teach criminal justice. I run a college program. And um, hopefully I can add some practitioner knowledge to the uh, notion that we have gotten a big F- minus in the drug war. Now, let's take a moment out and be a bit more specific because, in fact, you have quite an illustrious career. Uh, I mentioned this before we brought you online. Corrections officer, deputy sheriff, internal legal counsel, chief of staff, Mm -hmm. superintendent, special sheriff under six elected sheriffs 
in three counties, you must have been witness to a tremendous amount of change as it relates to drug policy in your part of the country. I have. Um, I have. Let's talk we, we've about gone that. from, uh, you know, we've gone from you know standard drug enforcement to mandatory minimums hmm. to mm. the law and order narrative to the lock up and throw key away mentality. Wow. Um, but fortunately, uh, in Massachusetts today at the county level, most of the sheriffs have embraced. Uh, a re-entry approach. Mm. Uh, that doesn't change the drug war, but, but at least what it does is, is it recognizes from an institutional point of view that 98% of the people that we incarcerate in this nation get out of jail. How about and that? We don't deal, how about that? So we, we don't deal, deal with, them with again. addiction as a public mm-hmm. health problem. Um, we're going to just return people to a community where their dealers will find them, where they will reoffend, get high, and unfortunately, with the opioid crisis at the point that it's at, probably die. Hmm. And that's why I'm that's why I'm in leap because the drug war is a failure. And the only way to change the drug war is to educate people as 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 many people as we can find to listen to us about the need to regulate, tax allow people to buy and use, at least at the marijuana level, treat the higher level drugs as a public health problem, which they are, as a disease, which they cause, and stop the punitive approach. So that's that's why I got in, into LEAP. Now, David, you mentioned briefly that there is a reevaluation of drug policy in your part of the woods in Massachusetts. Uh, Forgive me, I've got a a calendar or let's, well, let me, let me just pull it up. You know, one thing I love about the internet, I call it the incredible answer box. So I went to pull up (laughs) the various states. And while that comes up, uh, Massachusetts is now yes on safe and legal access for medicinal. Can you break that down for us? Sure. So we are uh, we've been we've been yes on medicinal for a few years. Uh, we also did a decriminalization of marijuana to a civil violation, uh, allowing possession of an ounce or less. And then last fall, uh, the voters voted to support question four, which was a ballot initiative legalizing the recreational use of marijuana, which means that as soon as the state legislature uh, gets this thing organized, we will have a Cannabis Control Commission, similar to the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission that we're all used to in our respective states, and we will have uh, licensed and legal retail establishments where people of age uh, can procure marijuana, and we will have a home grow provision, which will allow people to grow for use, personal use, and the remainder of the criminal statutes with respect to uh, sale or harm to another while under the influence or possession at the wrong age will remain in effect. So right now in Massachusetts, it's legal to possess based upon the ballot initiative, but we have not implemented the home grow slash retail licensing portion of the law. Now, David, I want to get my mm-hmm. co-host and esteemed colleague, Equal to Wolf, uh, on with us momentarily mm-hmm. to talk about that whole distribution, um, dispensary, um, regulation element of it. My data is dated. I noticed uh, when I pulled up something from ProCon.org, thank you very much, folks over there, Massachusetts in 2012 had ballot question number three. And it appears here, according to their statistics, that 63% of Massachusetts, uh, of the Massachusetts population, uh, said yes to some greater or lesser degree. We discussed this on a previous show, and one of the things we were perplexed by was the notion that, at least back in 2012, things have changed. Uh, ballot question four has come up, as you mentioned. There was this 60 day supply for personal medical use that limited it to 10 ounces. 
And I was curious about that, both Ecor and I and some of the other guests that night when we talked about this. Uh, what, how was it determined that a 60-day supply would be sufficient for the population, let's say the medical cannabis community out there in Massachusetts? And, and who said that 10 ounces was enough? I'm curious. <laughs> Well, that's a, that's an open question, and I right. can say to you honestly that that was that was considered in 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 many uh, in many venues to be very arbitrary, right? Uh, because there really is no way to determine what's appropriate in terms of the medicinal use. Um, and I will and I will caution also with respect to the medicinal use sort of bureaucracy um, that has not been fully established yet. Hmm. Hmm. So there is a huge lag time, and, and I can only speak for Massachusetts because I haven't lived in other states. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a long lag time between a ballot initiative uh, of this magnitude and actual implementation in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And so we're still, we're still in the process of implementing the medicinal piece, um, and so there is some arbitrariness to these amounts. Now, to the extent that we get the recreational use piece and retail sale taken care of, um, some of that may go away. Hmm. But in the meantime, we're in limbo. I, I, I would characterize the Commonwealth right now as in limbo. We're not fully vetted and bureaucratized on the medicinal piece, and we're probably a year away from full implementation of the recreational piece. In fact, a piece of legislation was filed recently uh, and it would, if passed as is, uh, it would increase the tax for retail sale in excess of 16%, uh, which is counterintuitive to our, to our goal to put out the illicit dealer. And it would severely restrict sales in cities and towns where local ordinance prohibits it. So, having said that, the latest news in the Commonwealth as of yesterday is that the majority of the legislative committee that reported the bill out has also gone on record saying that they won't vote for it on the floor as written. David, so you see, we're in a... We're, go but, ahead. No, you go ahead. Please, continue. So, so, so what we're having now is we're having, the, this, we're having a legislative debate about how the ballot initiative, which was fairly specific is going to end up looking like uh, with full implementation. Right. And, of course, people who were on record in favor of question four are saying foul. Um, we already have a 6.25% per, uh, sales tax in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on goods and services. Across the board. Uh, across the board. So mm-hmm. question four would impose an additional tax. So the proponents understood this and, you know, propose an additional tax uh, of 12%, a little bit higher than 12%. Now, this new piece of legislation would put it above 16% and would give cities and towns unilateral authority through their council or board of selectmen, which is what we have that governs our towns, to restrict or prohibit sale within those geographical jurisdictions. Now, we don't think that this is going to pass. Um, from a LEAP perspective, I, ha- I have to say it, it shouldn't pass. I hope it doesn't pass because it defeats the purpose, which is to legalize, regulate, wipe out, the supp- wipe out the supplier who's the illicit seller, get into education and prevention for our kids, make it available to folks who are legally capable of procuring and using it properly, and then keeping the penalties for people who obviously, like anybody who's drunk, somebody who is under the influence of marijuana, and they're out and they harm somebody, we should punish that. So um, in terms of the specifics, I can't give you many right now because hmm. we don't know where we are legislatively. Hmm. You know, I, I've got to ask this question, and I've asked this question of many uh, speakers from LEAP. You guys are out there, as we often say, at the tip of the spear, on the very front line of the drug war. This is almost a, an unanswerable question, but it's almost rhetorical, but I'm going to pose it to you anyway just for the challenge. Why do you think we we are having such a struggle with this, especially, let's say, as it relates to cannabis? Something Mm -hmm. most people agree nowadays, both recreationally 
uh, and especially medicinally, does more good than harm for right. patients out there who need it for various ailments that have been well established by the medical community, and even for recreational cannabis users who seem to say, yes, I want safe and legal access. I don't want to get busted and, and waste my entire hard work throughout life going to jail and then going to court just because I had a single J on me. Why, right. why are we struggling well, with this it, issue so hard? Well, here, here's my answer. Uh, as a society, we have become enculturated to the idea, starting in the 1930s with the Marijuana Tax Act, that we associate bad people and bad things morally and otherwise with cannabis. On the other hand, we've embraced alcohol. We can sit here and cite statistic after statistic about the dangers of alcohol. And you know how the, the dangers and the damage. But just think about how I mean, just think about how backwards that sounds. I mean, and how it is because you, we all know that anybody is getting cons- I mean, consuming alcohol and they consume too much. You know, we all know where it takes us. We ta- that's why they call it spirits. It takes you to a whole other level. You become a whole other person. But one thing about this right. cannabis is, I know no one who's ever OD'd. I know no one who's ever really got. I mean, never got sick off of it. Or the side effect is, I, I'm going. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat some food right now, and I'm going to relax. You know, some people they that's like more like the peace plant, because. People come around. They, they they gather around when this particular plant is ignited into the uh, air. Everybody starts uh, smelling the, the smoke resonating. So people gather around because it's a, it's a, it's a communal thing. It's a, a like I said, peace a peace plant. I've known no one to actually like fight afterwards. It's like what do we were what are we were even right. arguing about? You know, it's like peace, brother, peace, sister. You know, and but yet alcohol, sure. well, the prohibition era and all the era, you know, situation. And it's just like people are dying. Committing suicide off of well, alcohol. Right. We, we, we can't go five minutes we can't go five minutes during a sporting event without seeing an advertisement for alcohol. So we've been exactly, sensitized exactly. to embrace alcohol. Can your beer do um, this? And <laughs> and we regulate it. But you know, here here's here's the rub. I mean I have three teenagers. I say to my hmm. three teenagers, Hey, what's easier to get? What's easier to get, alcohol or, or marijuana? Well that's easy, Dad. Marijuana's easier to get. Alcohol, well, you know, you got these rules, you know. You can't just uh, you know, you got rules about alcohol, right? Yeah, all you have with uh, marijuana is a pusher. Right. So, uh, you know, they're happy to sell you marijuana. We don't know what the content is. We don't know how strong or weak it is. Uh, you know, so what we need to do is we need to get people over that, over that hump of, of, you know, what was done so well 40 years ago when we declared the drug war. We declared the drug war by using people's emotions. Look this is bad and, and it's associated with the bad people and therefore it is bad. And therefore okay? all that's part and of programming. Of, and, and then we go to criminal penalties mm-hmm. and, you know, we have a disproportionate enforcement. Um, you know, um, African Americans uh, use less marijuana at the teenage level than white Americans do, but our enforcement resources mm-hmm. are directed disproportionately to minority low income neighborhoods. It's terrible. And so th- this entire narrative uh, is class based. Uh, it is based upon um, a public policy that was hatched uh, to really target populations in the late 60s and the early 1970s, and it stuck. And, you know, what upsets me the most as a former law enforcement official or a retired law enforcement official is that I've seen from the inside what happens to people who have a criminal record. So, David, and not just retired, not just former but also frustrated. You got to be. I, I, I am. I, I can I only am, imagine 30 years on the job, and even though you did your part and did your part well, the idea that <coughs> all of that time you spent fighting this ridiculous battle <laughs> ended in you retiring, still fighting, fighting the, battle, the battle, even though you're off the field of battle. It's, it's, it's amazing. It just won't let you go. Well, here, can you once say? Can you once right. say at one point, David, that you were uh, actually programmed uh, to you know believe in the beginning as an of officer? Because, you know, you were programmed really believing this. I was too. Don't but, get don't get it twisted. You yeah. were too. You yeah. you you yeah. you're an athlete. Yes. yes. You're a former athlete. Yes. You're a retired athlete. Let's yes. just say. Yes, I was. I, I, I'm just a regular guy from I Philly, was. but I was a straight guy. I didn't yeah. believe in cannabis. I remember David when 
I'd be in Philadelphia and catching the bus or coming from a store and some little kid in the 90s would walk up to me and say, hey, man, I got that killer. <laughs> and, and they were talking about cannabis, and we're going to expand our conversation. We're going to skip right through the break and take this as long as we can because we know it's late there on, on your part of the, uh, the country. But yep. uh, I remember these kids would walk up to me, and the first thing would pop in my head, and then eventually out my mouth is, who would want to smoke that? You know, it was, a, it was a street <laughs> vernacular for I've got some the good best. cannabis. The best. Um, the, the, the whole battle against cannabis, even at the community level, has devastated so many communities, so many lives, so many families, not just black, as you articulately point out earlier, also in the white community. Um, it, it, I just don't get why the politicians aren't listening to LEAP. You, you guys are well, telling the absolute truth. truth Why the truth. aren't they listening to you guys? Because they don't want well, to. I think it, I, they don't. I think it, I think they need to hear a strong constituent voice, because I think that that, that elected officials clearly, <coughs> clearly, want to be want to be where their constituents are, and so we have to we have to scale the wall, so to speak. We have to get out and say, "Hey, I wore a uniform." carry a badge, probably carry a retirement ID and badge, uh, and it's okay to talk about this. You know, uh, it's okay to talk about the fact that 600% increase in alcohol poisoning happened when alcohol was bootlegged and was prohibited. And kids are walking around in schools, pushers are showing up, they're getting, they're getting their pot that way, and their brains aren't developed. We're not putting the money into prevention programs that are meaningful. And then what do we do when uh, all of a sudden the pusher says, you know, if you like the weed that I've been selling you, hey, try this pill. Uh, legalization and regulation is the only sane, intelligent, appropriate pathway because people are going to do what they're going to do. We shouldn't interfere with what people do. We should educate people. And, you and know, we should provide people with a legal opportunity as long as people don't hurt each other. David, that's, why, that's why LEAP exists. Law enforcement is about preventing people from hurting each other. Each other. And yeah. let's keep it real. If someone wants to hurt themselves, well, how much can you do about that, officer? We want, we want meaningful prevention programs so that people have factual information about what can happen. Look, I'm a dad. First and foremost, I'm a dad. With teenagers, teenagers, you said, yeah. Okay, in a horrible time. We have a horrible, horrible opioid crisis time, in David. this nation. Okay? Horrible. Um, but if you ask me point blank whether or not I'm uh, going to oppose the idea that at some point when it's legal and appropriate for my kids to smoke marijuana, if they make that choice, it should be safe, it should be approved, it should be tested, and it should be available. And the fact in the meantime, the... I'd like... Please, in continue. In the meantime, I'd like to see money... You know, Colorado, $140 million on average mm. the first year. You look at the governor of Colorado has, has said publicly that he's a father. He was initially against it. Um, all the things that everybody said were going to happen when legalization occurred, the sky was going to fall, uh, the moral corruption of the, of the universe was going to happen. None of those things happened in Colorado. Cannabis is a gateway drug. Once they start with cannabis, they'll be buying crack. Not true. No. I mean, look. Everybody that uses heroin, or the majority of people that use heroin, come at some from point the doctor's in their lives office. Use alcohol or pot, yeah. but the majority of people who use both alcohol or pot uh, have not gone on to cocaine or heroin. And how about but this, again, these too, are the, David? How, how about the fact that but, I think most people who have opioid addictions that lead to heroin uh, develop those addictions through the medical physician community? That's, that's, Yes, they do. They, Tragically, they, they, the majority it, it, of the people come through prescriptions, mm -hmm. back pain, leg pain, appropriate mm -hmm. use that turns into un inappropriate use. Um, it's a five dollar a bag situation where I'm standing right now in the little town of Greenfield, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We have people in the community that are at fifty bags or more a day. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes a cheap alternative. We need treatment on demand. We need supervised injection facilities. We need not to punish medical condition. Uh, and again, um, you know, LEAP is a, is a way that I can be a little piece of this. Uh, being on your show, um, addressing groups, um, 
Um, I'll be addressing a group at the local college on Tuesday uh, who are people who are family members of recovering heroin addicts. This is a national problem. Uh, it was disappointing that the last administration didn't do something about cannabis on Schedule A. Um, I understand. But, David, was the administration or was it the federal uh, drug administration? Was it the uh, 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 – can, can we make a distinction here? Can we say it was, It had less to do with Barack Obama and more to do with the politics of Washington, um, the DEA, yep. per, perhaps the DEA, but at least uh, the drug administrations, Big Pharma, their sure. lobbyists. And we, I, and I we think that's thing, why we didn't get rescheduled. We have another thing that I call the criminal justice industrial complex. Oh, my God. Let's talk about it. Yeah. When Colorado was contemplating, when Colorado was contemplating in their legislature the legalization of marijuana, the Corrections Corporation of America spent $1 million a day lobbying to keep high penalties and incarcerative sanctions in place for marijuana possession. Okay? Wow. This is the real world. This isn't the pretend world. I, I refuse to be in the pretend world. In hmm. the real world, prisons are a business. Yes. Prisons make money. Prisons provide jobs. In your state, in 2002, 18% of your California budget went to prisons, and 2% went to higher education. So let me ask this question. So would you, would you, I mean, would you be willing to say or agree that this war on drugs, because I had a call, I mean, I had a, uh, somebody out there on social media just hit me up and said that, uh, the reason for this war on drugs is, is more or less racism. Would you would you want to say like ninety percent or hundred percent that that's the answer for part of? I'm going to tell you this. Yes, I'm giving a yes. It is. It is in part in a large part. I'm giving a lecture at my at the college where I teach entitled entitled um, mass incarceration in America in the age of equal rights, and its focus is going to be racial disparity in public policy, nice. which has led to the incarceration of an overwhelmingly disproportionate percentage of African-American men in a country where young African-American men represent one-seventh <laughs> of our population. <laughs> Did you know I was... So this is a, Go ahead. This is class-based. It's race-based. It's socioeconomic. It's policy-based. It's scary. It's It's scary. I was on the receiving end of that at one point, David, and uh, I say that I've spoken about this, you know, quite a few times on our show because the subject arises, but uh, with different guests. But uh, hadn't I known uh, laws? Hadn't I hadn't I not been educated? Uh, hadn't I not known people? And had you know, had God been there first and foremost over all, uh, I would have been serving yep. twenty years in the penitentiary, and then it had got reduced down to fifteen years, and then it got reduced down to a year, you know, and, okay. and so, right. and I, I know, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. So, so you're, so you're, so you're, so you have been on the receiving end of a criminal justice system that is broken. Mm -hmm. Very much and, broken, warped. And, and what we're not doing is we're not paying attention to that. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why, um, you know, each and every one of us that has a, has an interest in this hmm. need to educate folks, not to tell people how to think. Right. I'm not. I'm never going to tell anybody how to think. Somebody exactly. can decide marijuana is bad. But you put Let's the information out there. Address, we need to address <clears throat> reality. Mm -hmm. We have we have racial racially motivated public policy exists in America. Right. Uh, socioeconomics matters when we deploy resources in a lot from the law enforcement community. It shouldn't matter, but it, it but it happens to matter. No. And here's a, here's a, here's a statistic on recidivism, right? So there is credible evidence now which supports that when you put somebody in jail between 12 and 18 months, at the end of that period, between 12 and 18 months, the deterrent effect is over. Hmm. Okay, so, you know, we're talking Where about mandatory are we minimum. with recidivism right now, David, would you estimate? Because I know you have worked in the recidivism, penal system. Recidivism ranges anywhere from 30 to 60 percent across wow. the board. We're doing some real progressive things. The sheriff I worked for, I'll be honest with you, in my county here where I just retired, one of the most progressive people I've ever met, um, dedicated 100 percent to reentry 
uh, likes to refer to the jail as a locked treatment facility as opposed hmm. to a jail. Um, tremendous things can happen. At the so start, there are there are there are public safety officials in this country who are recognizing this, and I happen to live in a county where it's happening. At the start of the show, we played a clip from Neil Franklin. You know, he's he's everywhere. Uh, one of yep. you guys best advocates for law enforcement action partnership uh go to leap.cc folks if you're tuned in right now uh this show is live to tape david so everyone will get a chance to go back and watch it the link will be up we'll send it over to leap please share this link because this becomes part of the historical narrative and that's an important element as well this is part of the historical narrative your your teenagers will be proud of you uh, I, I would pray, proud of you for where you stand right now. Uh, the interesting thing, and I'll get back to this question for you because we always pose it to all of the LEAP members, particularly folks who have as much tenure in law enforcement as you do, what made you make the LEAP? Hold that thought. Um, when you talk about um, w- what I'm understanding now is a part of the new vernacular called harm reduction as it relates to law enforcement. Uh, one of the, as I said earlier, as I led into this, I talked about a clip we pay, played from Neil Franklin and this whole new concept of harm reduction, meaning that law enforcement is, not, is no longer so heavy-handed. Uh, the judicial system is, is no longer so heavy-handed and unequally weighted against people of brown and black skin. Um, the, the wraparound services that are available are more encompassing of those who have been most severely injured or harmed by previous policy. Is that a part of what you guys are employing out there in Massachusetts, particularly in your hometown, harm reduction as it, it relates to law enforcement? Can you speak to that? It, it absolutely is. We have a district attorney, a sheriff, and court officials who are, and this isn't, we use the word collaborate too loosely, they are truly collaborating. We have an opioid task force. We have a district attorney that's got treatment programs which are being signed up for in lieu of people being prosecuted. They're completing the program. They're getting into treatment. The sheriff's doing the same thing with reentry. It's real. But here's the, here's the story. That's hard work. It's easy to blame the people who become the victims of drugs and lock them up and say bad people. The Hmm. hard stuff is coordinating, understanding that a supervised injection facility, which is starting to take hold in the eastern part of the state, or treatment on demand. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We. we, I mean, harm harm reduction means that we have police departments now in, in many pockets of the country. You get there, you're in trouble. You ask for help. You're not arrested. We have to replicate this. Hmm. We know what bad people can do. We know that we have bad people in our society. People who have a disease need help. Yes. And harm reduction tries to do two things. Let's prevent people from dying first. Hmm. And then let's have treatment available to them. And law enforcement can play a crucial role in this, but the collaborative part is what you need. You need citizen buy-in. You need the Chamber of Commerce to say, hey, we'll hire these guys to come out of the facility who have successfully completed these programs. You need to hook them up with real, meaningful linkages and a phone number to call. I've had more than one inmate come up to me in my career and say, I'm getting out in five weeks. I haven't used heroin inside. Uh, As soon as I get out, my dealer's going to find me, and I'm scared. Wow. This is hard work. We have have collaborative. I'll tell you, uh, you know, we're 3,000 miles apart right now. We have a collaborative group of public officials in my county. Um, they're part of the reason why I am so open about participating in this. It's not that I wasn't aware of what we were doing for 30 years, lock people up, now we label them, now they're criminals, no treatment or minimal treatment, put them out back in the community, no assessment of their criminogenic risks or needs, they get back into a situation that's untenable. Well, guess what? If I'm a citizen and I get locked up and then I get out of jail and I only have half the rights that I used to have, but I'm told to be a good Hmm. boy and get a job, the likelihood that I'm going to succeed is about zero to five percent, right? Right. We can do better than that. And and to my friends in law enforcement who say, you know, you know, what's happening to you? You know, you're all about all this. You're getting that a little bit, huh? Right. You're getting that. You know what I say? 
I say true public safety encompasses harm reduction. Hmm. True public safety encompasses legalizing and regulating these substances so that we can do prevention and education. And we know they have the funds out there. The the funds are allotted. It's so many so many uh, bullshit funds that that are being taken and not utilized the right way in the correct fashion. That we know that those funds can be pulled back and, 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 and issued over into those particular programs easily. Look, look. Here's the story. Anywhere from 25000 per year, upwards of 60000 per year, can be the cost to incarcerate one person in the United States of America. Right, right. And that's why they don't mind giving you all those years. Let them finish. So, right. So let's incarcerate people who present an emergent public safety threat to physically harm other people, okay? And then let's deal with these other issues sanely and intelligently. What? And, and I've seen it, and I've experienced it, and I was part of it in, in the last several years of my career. So I, I just want to carry that message. What do you say for all the other officers that are still under that poisonous thought process? You know what I mean? Well, let's not. I, 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 let, well, well, hold on, David. Let, let me. I would like to say for my own part, I'd like to uh, a little disclaimer, and that is, I, I I understand the bulk of the mindset of law enforcement. I know cops. Mm-hmm. Uh, I grew up around cops, not connected to my family, but a neighbor down the block and a, a son of that neighbor who became one and parties I'd go to but in they Philadelphia. Were once revered. But they were but, once but, revered. But hold on, hold on, you let know? me just finish. So, um, and, and, and even now I think it would be incredibly unfair to paint uh, what law enforcement is doing in this country and the hard work and the great work they're putting in as part, and I'm not saying you're saying this either. I just no, want to make this all. disclaimer on behalf of the network and the and the show mm-hmm. that any of that is poisonous or toxic. They're tasked to do a specific mission, and and it takes a t- some time for them to make the leap yes. in career, in exactly. faith, in belief, in everything, even from friendships. Yeah. I heard you say, David, momentarily ago that some of your friends are saying, hey, man, what's going on with you? Exactly. But, but you, you really, you represent for us as advocates what we've longed for as a voice in this community. And that is, listen, if I like tobacco uh, and I know it's dangerous and I keep smoking, then damn it, that's my that's problem. That's my choice. If I like choice. to yeah. drink all day long, and I'm not, I'm not claiming this. If I want to drink all day long and lay in an alley, as long as I'm not hurting anybody else, that is so fundamental to humanity that you've got to leave people be where they are, as long as they're That's not hurting choice. anyone else. That's their choice. You know. And as I said earlier, you know, if someone wants to hurt themselves, I, the object of, of of law enforcement is to protect people from other people doing them harm. You really can't protect anybody from doing them self harm. It's, it's just that it's just it's that, really difficult. It's just the people who are. And upset. I don't think law enforcement should be tasked with that mission. One of the many of the guests and speakers from Law Enforcement Action Partnership have said, "I don't want to be at the side of the road, have pulled you over, and it's almost time to go home you, for work." Yeah, <laughs> I, it's it's the last part of my shift. Right. I pulled you over. You had a drink at a bar. Now it's turning. Now it gets else. complicated. I killed you, or you killed me, or you, you know, something hurt. Me. God forbid. You, you 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 smoked and drank. Maybe you're bonged out. Maybe I saved your life. But do I really have to lock you up and ruin your life to put you through a program, a harm reduction program, harm reduction to? Everybody, including that officer who's out there naked and alone at the side of the road with somebody who's got a medical issue. And you're not getting... Um, you know, this whole thing with Tiger Woods, even. You're not rehabilitating in prison. Yeah. You're not re- came out that Tiger Woods was, was drunk, and it turned out that the, the back pain medicine he's taking, mm-hmm. it, it, he it's, had it's, too look, much it, of it. it. Right. It's, it's so well, tragic. Here's, here's what I just kind of want to say as a final please, comment. Please. If we, Sorry. as a community, law enforcement community and the wider community... If we want to tackle addiction, which is, which is a goal for all of us, we have to tackle our own addiction to punishment. Yes, oh correct. boy, say that again. Absolutely. If we want, yeah, if we want to tackle addiction, let's tackle our addiction, uh, our addiction to punishment. Hmm. Let's get down in the trenches. Let's get real about what the problems are. Let's deal with the treatment piece. Let's stop labeling people as felons. Let's get people into a workforce situation with some co- continuity of treatment. And, and, and let's do it as a community. Let's do it as a society. Mm-hmm. We need police. We need police. Absolutely. 
Yes, so he do. doesn't have to do more than is 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 uh, should be expected of them. Uh, let police deal with people harming one another. Let as as our as our uh, get the one of real our bad guys. Norm Samper, who's been around for years. Love Norm. Um, We've had him on. Yes. You know, I mean, what does he always talk about? He talks about having to deal with the with the drug issue. Uh, at the expense of dealing with the assaultive behavior calls. That's mm. ridiculous. Not wow. testing not testing rape kits because we have uh, backups in drug labs. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Open the backup up. <laughs> Open it up. So, David, uh, uh, first of all, let me give you a rousing round of applause. Thank you. you you've, you've got to be one of the most exciting leap speakers that we've had on in recent time and all of you guys bring an incredibly different perspective just based on your regions the places that you live grew up uh became law enforcement officers practiced law enforcement then retired how you got connected with leap it, it is an incredible it, it, you guys almost are your own universe of yeah. knowledge and insight exactly as it relates to the drug war i just wish our legislators our our politicians would somehow connect with you, you, you men and women, and understand where you're coming from because you're speaking the truth and nothing but the truth. It's just amazing what you contribute to our dialogue and throughout the country. You don't just speak here; mm -hmm. you speak all over the place. Hey, you want to give a, a plug yeah. to the next event you're going to be at? Because we are global. Yep. You, you're going to be at a new, another event coming up. You said on Tuesday. Is that correct? I'll, yes, I'll be at the local college on Tuesday talking about uh, opioids and heroin addiction with folks who are coping with it with their families. Which and, college? Uh, it's called a uh, it's called a Learn to Cope, which is a statewide program for family members Very nice. of folks that have uh, heroin addictions. Now, where's the location? Where's no, the the, the, you don't have to plug at all that. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. in Green, Greenfield, Massachusetts. Okay, you said the local. All right, that's college. fine. Yeah. All right, so. Um, any closing comments you'd like to share with us, and be sure to plug the website, any social connections that you might have before we roll out. Yeah. I, I would just urge the audience to go to lawenforcementactionpartnership.org. Take a look at what, we're ha what we have to say. Uh, donate if you can. Sign up uh, for any information. And talk to your neighbors. Talk to your friends. Well, we talk to members of the, the, the groups that you're part of. It was a definitely it's a pleasure to have you on. It takes a societal effort, man. Man, it does. It does. And it's a pleasure to have you on because we had another. We have a. We have. Because we have another guest that's uh, call, another call in guest coming up. Name her name is uh, Alexis D'Angelo, and she was calling in, but then I uh, hear, texted her back, and she said, uh, "I said uh, go ahead and call in." She said, "No, let him speak because he's good." So she's giving you, <laughs> she's giving you uh, ma major respect and major ups too, you know. So we want to shout out to Alexis D'Angelo, who's going to be calling in right after this break coming up, and then she has a lot to speak about as well because she's very knowledgeable. And uh, shout out to her company, Precise Cannabis, and she'll be on in a minute. David, thank you so much once again, man, for joining us. And we'd love to have okay, you guys. back in the very near future. Stay All right, Dave. Good luck. Take care of yourself. God bless. Okay. Yep. All right. Bye -bye. David Lenoy, one of the most phenomenal uh, speakers we've had on from Law Enforcement Action Partnership. Want to give a shout out to Michaela and all the crew, Jack Cole, Peter Chris, the founders, all of the great guests that we've had on. Lee. Let's take a quick break. I know we've got a special guest joining us via Skype right after this, so yes. don't go away. The marijuologists, precise, precise, I wish they were there. We, your chair precise, is sitting right there. It's we'll right be here. right back. Precise Cannabis coming up. What's up? This is James Ship inviting you to join us every Wednesday at 7 p.m. for Ballers World Live, where we're talking basketball and bullshit. So don't forget, tune in to Ballers World Live it's every Wednesday soccer. at 7 p.m. exclusively on latalklive.com and the America Talk Live Broadcast Network. You can also catch us on Ustream and YouTube, and now live on Facebook, or watch and listen directly at latalklive.com. Reality Radio handcrafted for your listening pleasure. This is L.A. Talk Live, and we're more than just talk. Join the 3 p.m. Pacific, 
each and every Friday from Los Angeles today. Purple nights and golden days. Ooh, we he's so LA. What up, LA? It's Mr. Vaughn inviting you to join me every Friday, 3 p.m. Pacific for Los Angeles today. <laughs> Live and direct from LA Talk Live. Entertainment, sports, special guests, current events, and the hottest and latest in LA. This is where the twist goes down daily. Boss up with us. Boss up with us each and every Friday on LA Talk Live. You can also catch us on iTunes RB or check us out live on LA Talks. Reality Radio, handcrafted for your listening and viewing pleasure. This is LA Talks Live, and we're more than just talk. Gentlemen, to the world's only show that gets to the very root of the medical cannabis issue throughout California and the globe. Let me fix things up here a little bit, man. This is LA Talk Live, and I am your humble host, aka the marijuologist, uh, Richard Carr. Joining me, as always, my esteemed colleague. Let me swing the mic to him. Oh. His name, you might know him from such shows as The Wolf's Den. He called The Wolf, joins yeah. me as always. Yeah. And you've got a, a special guest on the line, right? Yes, we do. We got the lovely Stay Alexis. The lovely Alexis D'Angelo coming from out of Precise Cannabis. And she's a cannabis company, cannabis PR firm, I would say. And uh, she's very well versed in the uh, cannabis culture. Is she there? Yeah, she should be on the line. Are you there, girl? Hello, hello. Uh-oh. Hello, hello. Hello there, Alexis. Hello. She's yeah. probably on the call right back in. She here. She's already watching the show. She's, she's on the line, watching. actually. Oh, she's on the line. She's probably on the other line. Like, hey, listen. If there. you're there, we can hear you. We can hear you. Stop talking to your baby daddy. No, actually, I can't hear her. Actually, I don't know what. Stop talking on. to your baby daddy. I'm hanging up on you. Call back. All right. So you know, before the break, we were talking to our good friends over at Law Enforcement Action Partnership, formerly known as Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. They've redefined their focus. And their dedication to their craft, and that's all about. Yeah, okay, there that's all is. about um, where they stand in the drug war. That means that you know they're not going for it anymore, for the okie doke anymore. They're not going for the notion that wow, we're going to just go out here and bust these people and lock them up and uh, put them away forever. No, th- these are people who have served at in every element of law enforcement uh, from the street cop to judges and everything in between. I mean, CIA, DEA, all the alphabets of the drug war, FBIC, you know, all that stuff. Um, you know, prison guards, penologists, sociologists who serve in the penal system, uh, trying to understand what make people come back over and over and over again. These are experts. Again, I got to say, why is it we don't understand where they're coming from enough that we would actually say, yo, you know, let's listen to them. Let's kill all this nonsense and get down to the real work that needs to be done. And that is putting money back into the community to rebuild our society from a community perspective. Man. Man. Hmm. All right, E-Quarter Wolf, yes. take it from here. We got the lovely, I'm lovely. Hey, man, let me tell you something. Like I was telling him earlier, uh, when I got when I had uh, served the time that I served for the, for the uh, you know, getting stopped with marijuana with cannabis, and I was in there with some white guys and everything. You know, they were coming in there, coming in and out, and they was getting caught with, like, some crazy, like, meth labs. Crazy numbers. Numbers. I mean, like, meth numbers. labs. Like, this is my fifth meth lab, and they steady getting probation, probation, these synthetic-ass drugs. You know what I mean? That's having people scratch a hole in their lip and their faces and stuff. And I'm sitting there like, you got what? And when I heard that, I said, man, I know I ain't going nowhere. I know they ain't about to send me nowhere. I'm going to stay right here and do this right here and blah, 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 and get on out. You know, but then I got sentenced, whatever. But 
I didn't serve all that time. So that was a good time, a good thing that they didn't give me all them numbers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it's just a crazy situation because we had a friend that uh that time that chimed in earlier on the, on the show who was saying that racism. I mean, the uh, drug war started. You know, is 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 about racism, first of all. But she said it started. Well, David Lenoy. It, it started with the Mexicans in Texas. All right, law enforcement. Way officer. back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It started with the Mexicans first yeah. in Texas. That's why you know? you know we don't use the term marijuana here, even though mm-hmm. the word marijuologist is our brand for the show. Uh, and 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 please hold on, caller. We we know and you're Alexis, there, and, and Alexis, there. chime in whenever you're ready. We use that because marijuologist sounds better than cannibologist. Right. <laughs> so. So, uh, but it's just a play on words. But the idea is we're just students of the plant. Mm-hmm. And that, not that that is a negative word derived strictly from racism, marijuana. Mm-hmm. But it was demonized, demonized in such a way to demonize Mexicans who were some of the first people who exposed America right. to this so great peace plant. To this you know. great plant, yeah. But so we got the lovely Alexis, Alexis what's going on with you, girl? Let's, no, let's give her a nice little intro. Let's yeah. not just, just – we're going to – Ladies and gentlemen, we want to give a rousing, rousing round of applause for the lady who's been very, very patiently waiting all day, all night while he's doing the show. And she also gave props to David, the other guest that was on the show. So that was a big up, sir. Give it up for Miss Alexis D'Angelo from Precise Cannabis. Hi, everyone. Hello, Alexis. How are you? Good. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. All right. She's a returning champ. Where's she calling in from? I'm in downtown Los Angeles. All right, DTLA. Okay, Alexa. she she was once here, uh, uh, you know, gracing us with her presence, mm-hmm. and uh, now we have the airway. I will again. Of course, most definitely. You're more than welcome. There's an open door policy for you. You're more than welcome. You know. Thank you. So tell us what's going on so out there. Since have, the, go ahead. There's a lot going on here in Los Angeles. Um, as you know, yesterday the trailer bill passed. Um, in, up in Sacramento, which really paves the way for um, delivery services, yes. which is really important. Um, and um, I'm really happy that the LA Cannabis Task Force has actually joined forces and come together with United Food and Commercial Workers, along with United um, Cannabis Business Association, in, in order to really forge ahead here in Los Angeles with the city and Board of Supervisors in order to get the regulations in the favor of um, the cannabis industry and our patients. See, I love this part of it because we got so many people that are well-versed in so many angles. It's like the machine, you know, Voltron. You put everything together, you know, Transformer. What's it's your organization? Super- can, we, can we get that out there? Sure. So um, I'm the Vice President of Development for Precise Cannabis. We are a thought leadership and PR firm here in sunny California. I'm also the market leader for Women Grow here in Los Angeles and uh, a big activist here as well as just trying to get people to understand that it's time for us to change the perception of cannabis medicine. It's time for us to call it what it is, cannabis. Um, I, I love what the name of your show, and I think it's great um, to be able to have a play on words. It definitely helps normalize the conversation, and Makes I it think fun. that's an amazing yeah. thing. Thank right. you. So, yes. Mm-hmm. So I, um, I, there's so much going on, and it's really important for everyone that's either a patient or interested in the industry or just actually are in the industry to speak up and participate in the regulations that are being uh, proposed at the moment and public comments are open. Mm-hmm. Wow. There's so much more to learn, so much more to go. So, I mean, do we have, do you think we still have like a long way to go or is it like getting it's shorter and shorter? What would your take be on that? Well, um, according to the law, they have to have the regulations in place from Jan- for January the 1st, 2018, for licensing. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, the cities and the local municipalities are kind of dragging their feet, waiting on the final guidance from the state, um, which we are we're receiving now. And like I said, the public comment is open for the next 60 days here in Los Angeles to talk about the proposed regulations within the city. Nice. So we narrowing it down. So we have. Go ahead. So on this coming this coming Monday, the LA Cannabis Task Force will be having a um, workshop from four to seven in the downtown Athletic Club, mm-hmm. and it's free for anyone that wants to attend. And again, that's the Los Angeles Cannabis Task Force dot org. Okay. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of emails from that as well. That's one thing about the task force. They they steady moving, man. They steady the they, they like the hired gun out there pushing it. You know. They're great. Yeah, they are great. 
everything. Definitely great. Shout out to Ariel Clark over there, Ruben Honig. Yes. You know. So you're going, <laughs> are you going? Ariel. Are, huh? The Ariel is great. Ruben is great. Actually, I was I had the pleasure of being on a panel with him yesterday. Oh, really? So, they're a great organization. They are. They are. They've been on our show a couple of times too, man. They are always a joy when they come here. Always a joy. So, are you going to you going to the next uh, set event? Yes, I, I will be there. Okay, cool. We plan on being Absolutely. there as well. Yeah, we plan on being there as well, soaking it up and getting all the knowledge. And further the message on, you know, using and utilizing our platform for the likes of the uh, precise cannabis and the SEDS and the task for LA task force, you know, so we're here. And I really appreciate it. And, you know, we're here for you as well. We're Thank here you. for the lawmakers. We're here for everyone that has questions. It's all about education and awareness. Exactly. And opening up that dialogue. Um, as I spoke, spoke earlier, I, had a meeting or a, was on panel with Ruben yesterday and afterwards I had another speaking engagement where it was just it was 30 people from all walks of life that were between 27 and 33 that hmm. really just want to know how can we open up the conversation with our parents with our right. loved ones with yeah. you know our, our employ, uh, employers mm -hmm. um, and it's just really it's great to see that people are really want answers I That's mean they want questions there's very knowledgeable um intake that was something like a therapy change. <laughs> that's almost like a therapy right it, there you know well i'd like to jump in where you alexis mentioned how to open up the dialogue with parents because mm -hmm. uh, that's a tough one that's a therapy like you know let's yeah. sit down with the therapist to talk you know mom let's understand this you know that it, we are we're not at that old school mentality anymore it's some because you have the recreational side but then yeah, you have the granddaddy's week then you have the <laughs> you have the medicinal the wellness the side of it because i was explaining to one of my friends uh uh, earlier, you know, saying, hey, it's time for you know, people to ed be educated because it's not just about the flower and I know about the plant. You know, it's, it's way more to it now, way more to it. These, I mean, we have voices of people out there. The face of cannabis has changed. It's not no hippie tie-dye shirts. And it just, it's that as well as more, you know, you have CEOs of companies, uh, uh, prominent people of all walks of life. Who are, are are open to be educated and want to get a piece of the, want, uh, want, the 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 industry too? Exactly, you know? want to get a piece of it. all right. Because I and I spoke to her want to get a piece of it. And I said, there, no, don't don't get me wrong. There's nothing uh, wrong with you know doing well while doing good. But it's not just about the money for me because I've had people that passed away from cancers and stuff. And, it, and what I know now with the with this uh, the flower outside of just uh, uh, being a patient and smoking it, it's like it's way beyond that now. It's like an epiphany. You know what I mean? And, and, and where we are now, it's so knowledgeable, and, and the technology opened the door for us as well. All these forms that we have, all the people of the women, of the women grows, and the uh, women above grounds, and you know, all let's the talk different about over, the women know. growers Absolutely. now because there certainly has been a tremendous movement of women in advocacy it more sure these has. days. It sure has. I remember going over to always men growing. Uh, 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 Oak Sedam University when they were on San Vicente uh, right across from the Beverly Center or diagonally across and seeing a bunch of guys, you know, still the whole tie-dye image, mm -hmm. all that stuff. It certainly has evolved. And I remember reading an article, in fact, that talked about women who, who are corporate executives and high level at that coming home and maybe saying... I don't want the wine tonight. I'd like to have me a nice indica to unwind, be it through Absolutely. flour or through tincture or wax or dab or brownie or popcorn. Right. <laughs> because there's so many infused uh, varieties of ingesting this plant. And now we've got women above ground. Big ups to Bo Money, Bonita Shout Money. Out. Uh, she's got an event coming up soon. We've got said. You know, the cannabis educational dialogue. Shout out to Andrea Drummer. All these complicated. Chef. Andrea iter, iter, you know, evolutions, let's say, iterations of the medical cannabis movement that are evolving just like yours. So can we get back to the event that you are representing? This is a City of L.A. regulation workshop. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. I have your banner up right now. Can you talk a little bit about us? About it? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, as I said, Los, uh, cannabis, Los Angeles Cannabis Task Force has joined forces with 
UBCA and the uh, the United Food and Commercial Union Workers uh, to join forces in order to really change the workplace mentality to help get the regulations in place. So we're meeting on Monday, um, the 19th of June, from 4 to 7 at the Athletic Club in downtown Los Angeles to open up the dialogue and, you know, to nice see where we too. can get input yeah, yeah. Um, for the, you know, the processing here in the Los Angeles um, city in order to be able to get the movement started. I mean, we're getting down to the line where, you know, we should already, as a business here in the city, be able to um, be licensed in order to apply for the state in January. And we don't have those regulations in place yet. So this is a very important meeting. We were within the 60 days for public comment um, on the proposed Los Angeles County uh, cannabis regulations. So we're going to meet and be able to educate everyone and give them a good guidance on what is to be expected in the next you know, few months leading up to January 1st, 2018, when it becomes legal. And to reiterate, the date is June 19th, mm-hmm. 2017. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yes. That's what we have yes, on our is. banner here, indeed. Um, can you tell me if, and this will be my last question, I'll uh, swing it to ECOR to wrap out the interview. How can Internet broadcasters like the Marijologist and our good friend Charlo Green is that right? Charlo Green, right? Yes. Um, yes, Charlo Green. Yeah. And uh, our good f- friends over uh, at uh, Cypress Hill, what's the brother's name? You know, there, there are other, you know, web-based, cannabis-infused and informed broadcast stirrers out there. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure this out, how to pose this question. What can Internet broadcast do to help some of the people coming into the industry. How do we help people like you get the word out about your message? How do we help new business owners from the commercial perspective get their word out and step into the, the advertising element of their business? For so many years we've been here. We've been doing this since 2009. And there's, there was this time when some of the most prolific collectives and dispensaries were afraid to advertise some weren't and did with us because they didn't want to you know peep their head above you know Ground. the trenches <laughs> uh, afraid to get you know to catch they were afraid to catch one in the noodle and you still got people like that right now still I'm, I'm sure the same way. but how can internet broadcasting and especially us on our network here at LA Talk Live and the America Talk Live broadcast network help you and your constituents get the word out more effectively. What can we do? I mean, I believe that you're doing an amazing job now. I think that we have to have these outlets, um, multiple different outlets, to hit different demographics throughout mm-hmm. different states. Um, everyone learns or picks up things differently. So, you know, hearing it multiple times from the same person doesn't always work. But if you hear it multiple times from 10 people, right. then people really start to say, oh, Good wow. Point. There's something here. It's consistency. And and it's really, I have to keep going back to this. We have to just change the stigma that's associated with cannabis. And once we change the stigma, then people will be more open to it. And it really is going to start with just being open dialogue and not looking down at someone that chooses cannabis over alcohol. As I mentioned when I was on the show previously, I left um, corporate America healthcare because I was tired of being on the Big Pharma Lifetime Loyalty Program, mm. and, you know, I had to, to leave my job, which is a very high-paying job, but I saved my life. I was able to get off six medications, reduce my blood pressure medication by half. Wow. I, you know, lost 60 Wh- pounds. I, so I, it, it, That's you amazing. know, for me, it's, you know, I'm the face of a cannabis patient, an advocate, and a business owner. And, and a pretty and face, too. changing the perception. And quite a beautiful face. With all due respect, quite a beautiful face. And I think that's important, too, because, again, when you think cannabis, you know, if you get past that word, it's weed and pot and herb and, you know, ganja and, you know, nappy heads and dreadlocks and uh, tie dye and beards. And that's 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 just not all there is to it anymore. We we have some very smart and sophisticated individuals who have rotated out of their of their careers from the military mm-hmm. to Fortune from, 500. From the news, <laughs> media. Everything from media, the military, Fortune 500, you name it. This is... But it, 
a new world. It's taken pioneers, yeah. Go ahead. No, it's taken the pioneers to do this, and, you know, the more we keep getting into people's faces, the more it's becoming more mainstream and normalized, the more that it's going to help the entire movement. And we have to remember it's adult use. It's for people that are over 21 that are able to make their own decisions, and that's what we have to focus on is just making sure that we remember the roots of where cannabis came from back in 1996 when um, the Compassionate Care Act was passed. We need to remember the, the legacy of that when we go into adult use because there were so many people's lives that have been destroyed over the last 20 years because of you know their effort to make cannabis medicine available to patients. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I like I, to you know, front line news work. outlets like yours are doing an amazing job. Thank to you. answer your question Appreciate about advertising, mm-hmm. you know, until January, it's going to be really difficult to be able to do a lot of advertising if you're not planning on being legal because you're really hmm. exposing yourself. You know, Weed Mass is a, a perfect example where, you know, people have been busted because they're on Weed Mass. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's just a lot of different things that, and that's you know, the insight we're, we're looking for here. see that's played out. Yeah, we're looking for that type of insight from someone with your expertise. So that's why I posed the question. Thank you mm-hmm. very much for that. Yes. And I like to call them the front line. We could like to call it the front liners, you know, the pioneers, the front liners. Because, you know, a lot of people went to jail on that front line to where we are right now. And the people are still locked up, incarcerated right now, uh, being on that front line. Absolutely. You know, and you got people Absolutely. that's Absolutely, and it's horrible. It's, it's very horrible. horrible. Very horrible. And, and luckily, you know, with 64 passed in November, those people are now eligible to get those um, convictions. You know, turned over dropped time. down to a misdemeanor, mm-hmm. which is, you know, a huge feat that a Drug Policy Alliance really fought for. Um, big props to them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the city of Los Angeles is doing an equity uh, reach-out program for licensing for those that have been um, marginalized and penalized due to cannabis. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's there's the states and the cities are wanting to make things right, and we have to believe in them, and we need to help them and give them guidance and support. Mm-hmm. Because exactly. it's a difficult situation to have to deal with in such a, a small amount of time. Exactly. And they're changing everything. Exactly. All right, guys. I think it, that yes. will about put a bow on it. But before we wrap out tonight, let's give out the details about the workshop you're putting up. Now, listen, uh, for the benefit of myself, I got to say, and for our tuners out there, um, Please join the UCBA. What is that? The UCBA is the um, an organization for the cannabis industry here in Los Angeles, the United Cannabis Business Association. Wow, I love the name. And, of course, we got the LA Cannabis Task Force and then the UFCW 770. Please explain. Yes, that's the Food uh, and Commercial Workers Union. Wow. All right, now. Give us the details about the workshop, please, front to back, top to bottom. Sure. Go. Hey, um, free reg- it's free. You can uh, register at, on Eventbrite. It starts at 4, four to 7 on Monday, June the 19th at the Los Angeles Athletic Club. Um, parking is $12, and the event is free. So we look forward to everyone coming out, showing their support, getting educated, and walking away with the empowerment to make the right decision. Okay. All right. Nice. Nice. Thank you so very, very much, Alexis. I know it's getting a little late, even here in L.A., but no we want to no. we want to thank you real, really no. though from the bottom of our hearts. Now, Alexis, how can and also, thank you Alexis, guys. I love you. How can thank how can so how can our listeners and uh, viewers uh, find you all as well? The cannabis, precise cannabis. How sure. can they find you? Yeah, precisecannabis.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. You can follow me personally at the four twenty diva. On Instagram and Twitter. The well. 420 Diva. <laughs> I'm going to be following you momentarily. <laughs> <laughs> this is all live to tape. We're definitely going to send you a copy. But that was, of the uh, honestly, no, that's what many people know. I'm actually the face of the 420 Diva. Oh, nice. okay. It's, I've never really, yeah. So, there hey, everybody is. now knows. There it is. Yeah. Now we know. We had just exposed it to the world. Alexis, thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a tonight. great weekend. We'll see you on Monday. We'll see no you doubt. out there on the battlefield. No doubt. 
So that's about the time to wrap it up, man. I want to yeah, send a couple man. shout outs out there. Please do. I want to send a shout out to Terry Nesmith, who was chiming in with us, giving us some uh, insight, you know, about the uh, Texas and the uh, racism about the, you know, it started with the Mexicans in Texas. I uh, want to send a shout out to uh, my friend out there in Orange County. I'm sorry, Huntington Beast. Send a shout out to Eileen out there. She's also a, a woman of law. And she was chiming in watching the show and hitting me up thank doing you, the Eileen. show. Eileen, we want to thank you for tuning in too. Pretty face, pretty smile, girl. All right. I want to send a shout out to uh, Christine out there in Baltimore because she always tuned in to watch the uh, LA Talk Live and watch whatever we're doing. And uh, shout out to Bridget Bardot out there, Bridget Buchanan, who's also the sister of Christina. So these are all our people, man. They tune in to watch us. They show us love, support. Let's and give a plug to uh, we King Harvest and oh. Lee and Bridget of King Harvest. Oh, yeah, Harvest. we definitely got to send us out to Lee Hope Simpson. Hope you tuned in tonight. Uh, Harvest, uh, Harvest, I mean, kingharvest.com, I mean, .org. Send us out to Lee Simpson and our girl Bridget out there, Squirtle. How about that we got a Bobby special Bretton. promotional program for veterans coming up? Yes, we do. Where King Harvest will be giving away 100 what? bottles of tinctures. Of high potency, highly effective tinctures for all lives. you veterans out there. Saving that lives. That addresses a wide spectrum of your issues. Of so your issues stay tuned elements. for that. We'll be talking more about that when we get uh, Lee Simpson and Bridget and King Harvest back in the studio. So, yeah, we on our way to a uh, Tupac event in a minute because uh, shout out to Tupac. I think it's even his birthday today, but we definitely know that there's a uh, movie is coming out. Send a shout out to Silk Silk 500 out there who's putting the event on and country style out there. So, we're going to be seeing y'all in a minute. It's at an undisclosed uh, location, but it's uh, at a mansion. Oh, that's cold. You're going to tell them what we got coming on. Called Thug Mansion, but uh, <laughs> we going to be that's there. Cold. You know what I'm saying? But I just want to send a shout out to my boy out there. You know, that's Silk cold. 500. You dig in big country out there, country style. We'll see y'all in a little while, y'all. Well, wait, before we go, we've shout also... Shout out to Bonoboville. That, too. Let's give a shout-out to our good friend, Dr. Block, Dr. over there. Susan Block. It was her birthday Indeed. last week, and uh, she had a nice, nice, beautiful uh, party. We turned up in there. I performed, and there was a whole bunch of performances mm-hmm. in there. I mean, it was an adult, an adult, grown, and sexy affair, baby. So, again, shout-out to Dr. Susan Block and Maximilian and the whole Bonoboville family over there. You and did? most importantly, let us give a hearty thanks to our good friend, David... Lenoy, who joined yes. us via Skype yes. all the way from Massachusetts. Oh, yes. Thank you, Michaela, for sending us all these incredible, Shout out to incredible Michaela. speakers. Thank you to Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Be leaping. Peter Chris, and also to our good friend uh, Jack Cole, founders of that organization. One day we'll get you on here, Neil Franklin, homeboy from the East Coast. But in the meantime, in between time, we'll see you next time. We won't be back next week. But the following week, we'll be back with a whole new lineup of live guests right here in the studios of LA Talk Live, no doubt. right here on the one and only The Marijuologist. In the meantime, we'll see you next time. Educate yourselves, Don't medicate yourselves, drive. educate, medicate, 420, baby. Ow! California smoke, I got the kind of dope to make a G nigga show. A couple tokes on the backwood, roll a king size that, cause the dope tastes that good. Playboy on the grind, fly chick on my side, going at Obama OG, how the nigga ride. Presidential down PCH, mandatory haters never want to see me straight. Fuck, stay high on the low, sticky icky icky dro. Give a herb a pass like Proposition 64. Five J's in my case stash, no you can't hit my smoke if your breath smell like straight ass. Eat weed, hit the spot, flavors like soda pop. Always got a blaze 20 minutes after 4 o'clock Wanna smoke, girl, you know who to call And when a nigga wanna stroke, yeah, I know who to call And that's true Cause I didn't say that I wanted to smoke uh-huh. Don't mean that I don't want to Don't mean that I don't want to I know you do That's cause I didn't say that I wanted to smoke Want to smoke. You say you want a nigga with the business, but you caught up in your feelings and the nigga want to keep it on the low. And I just want to smoke. I just want to smoke. Don't smoke with me. Thank you for tuning in to LA Talk Live and the Talk Live Broadcast Network. Original reality radio and crafted for your listening and viewing pleasure. This is LA Talk Live and we are more than just talk. Stay tuned.